Um, I'm so thankful for all God's blessings to us. Our scripture reading this morning, if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 37, Psalms chapter 37, verses 5 and 6. Psalms chapter 37, verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. And the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Trying something new today. I, when I was doing this sermon, I said, you know what, I'm going to try to put something on PowerPoint just to help with the presentations, you know, to make points. Uh, we'll see how it works. Uh, can you go back a slide there, Linda? Okay, here we go. How many of you folks know who this gentleman is? That is Michael Phelps. He was a swimmer, and he's regarded by many as being the greatest Olympian of all time. Michael Phelps started swimming when he was seven years old, and I find that kind of amazing because at seven years old, you don't know whether you're going to be five foot six or six foot five, right? You don't know. He just happened to end up being the perfect proportions for a person who was a world-class swimmer. I mean, he had long arms, big hands, big feet, long torso. And Michael Phelps, as I said, started swimming when he was seven. He went to his first Olympics when he was 15 years old. He did not win anything. But the next four Olympics, he would domina dominate swimming like no one ever has and probably no one ever will. In those four Olympics, he won 28 medals, 21 gold medals, five silver medals, and two bronze medals. And in that process, he ended up um, setting a world record 39 times, which means he, he set a world record and then he broke his own world record. And what was amazing is the training regimen that he, he did for himself. He would spend four to six hours every single day in a pool, 365 days a year. But what's really amazing to me is that he would take in over 10,000 calories of food every day, 10,000 calories. Now, you guys know my wife's a good cook. And with her good cooking, and I think with uh, Bill's homemade ice cream, I possibly could down 10,000 calories. I don't know, but there is no way that I could work off 10,000 calories. When I was dating uh, Jesse, uh, I was going to the gym every day. You know, you had to, when you're dating, you have to stay in shape afterwards. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so I would run on the treadmill, or probably I, I should say I would jog on the treadmill an hour a day, and I'd make sure that I burned a thousand calories. And, and in one year's time, I lost twenty some pounds. I went from one ninety to one seventy. But that's a thousand calories. This guy burned off ten times that amount of calories every single day. So when we look at Michael Phelps and ask the question, what was the most essential quality that helped Michael Phelps achieve the goal which he wanted to achieve, the answer, if you look in your bulletin, you know the answer in the next slide would be commitment. Michael Phelps was committed to becoming the best swimmer he could become and ended up, ended up becoming the best one ever. To be a Christian today requires commitment on our part and a commitment that most people aren't willing to make. And so in my discussion today, 
I'd like to look at four areas of commitment in the Christian life and what they mean to us as we walk along this journey. And those four areas of commitment are these. Number one, commitment to God. What's it mean to be committed to God? What's it look like? How can you know that you're truly committed to God? The second one is our commitment to the word. Are you committed to the Bible? You know, you look at Christianity today and you can find many churches that are not committed to the Bible. The third area of commitment we're going to look at for just a little while is commitment to prayer. Jesus was committed to prayer. He would pray all night. And if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? And finally, the fourth area of commitment we're going to look at is our commitment to each other, both outside of our community of faith and also inside of our community of faith. But before I begin, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, I ask that the Holy Spirit would be here. Please guide me in the things that I say. May they lift Jesus up. May they draw us closer to him. Amen. Are you committed to God? I've kind of asked easy questions before. Do you love Jesus? Questions where everybody could easily raise their hand. And this is another one, because if I said, are you committed to God? Raise your hands, everybody would, right? And I wouldn't argue with you, because this morning, when you got up, you got a shower, got dressed, had breakfast, and then you had a decision to make. And you could have decided to do 100 different things, but you decided to come to church. So that, that demonstrates some commitment on your part to God because you're here to worship him. But is that a commitment that God really requires of us? And the answer is no. And that, the reason for that is easy. We're all committed on different levels, right? Some people come to church every week. Some people come once a month. Some people come to church in Sabbath school. Some people blow Sabbath school off and just come to church. So church attendance is not the commitment that's required of us. Um, so what does commitment look like? Well, let's go to Scripture, and let's look at a gentleman who was one of the most unique characters in the Bible. And we're going to go to Luke, the first chapter. We're going to look at the life of John the Baptist. And I'm going to start reading in verse 5, and I'm going to skip a little bit. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Uh, I'm going to skip down. To 11, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He will be great in his sight. Of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts and fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So here we have the angel announcing the arrival of John the Baptist and what some of his characteristics would be. You can read John 3 later, which describes what the ministry of John the Baptist looked like. And you can clearly see that John the Baptist was committed to God. In fact, John was committed to God from birth. Or maybe I should say God was committed to John from birth because God gave him the Holy Spirit from the time he was born. And uh, there are many areas in which it's obvious that he was committed to God. Uh, for example, he was committed to a certain diet. 
and a certain way to dress. He was committed to never taking fermented wine or drink. And we know he followed all those rules. He dressed in a garment of camel hair. And you go back to 1 Kings 1.8, you'll see that Elijah dressed in a garment of camel hair. And that's why some people in Israel at the time John came along thought maybe this is John, uh, Elijah having come back from the dead. And uh, so you ask the question, is this the type of commitment God requires? And the answer is no. And I, I'm pretty glad of that because I, I'm glad that to be committed to God, I don't have to eat locusts. You know, if my wife brought me a burger and I saw a little leg sticking out, I said, what is this? It's a locust burger. I, 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 <laughs> I'd have some question, right? We know that John the Baptist was a great preacher. In fact, next to Jesus, he may have been the greatest preacher in the Bible. Uh, people came from all over to hear him preach. Even crusty old Herod, that wicked guy, he loved to hear John preach until John told him about his wife. He was totally unafraid to preach the truth. Again, take time and, and Luke three this afternoon, and you can see how quickly he was to condemn sin. I don't even think John the Baptist would make it in many churches today because he would hurt somebody's feelings real quick, you know, simply because he was telling the truth. But is preaching how we show we're committed to God? Of course not, because not everybody can preach, right? So what is it? The commitment that God requires must be the same for everybody. It's absolutely the same if you're rich or poor. And that was the message of the, the story of the widow's might. Jesus said she put in, with her one might, she put in more than the Pharisee who put in a whole bag of money. It's got to be the same whether you're educated or not educated. My father went to high school. He wanted to go to college, but was never able to because back then it was really hard. But I can tell you what, he was as committed to God as any professor at at Andrews University who has a PhD, it has to be the same no matter what race, whether you're Caucasian, African American, Hispanic, it doesn't matter, it has to be the same. And as John was preaching and Jesus began his ministry, the people who used to flock to John the Baptist were now seeking out Jesus. The huge crowds that he used to draw were now dispersing. His popularity, which was huge, was now becoming diminished. And the work that God had given him to do was now coming to a close. And his disciples saw this. So they came to him one day, in John 3, 26, and they said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, he's baptizing and everybody's going to him. And then John articulates what I believe is the absolute clearest definition of what it means to be committed to God. Verse 29, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. And here it is. It's only seven words long. Here's the definition for you and I, if we're truly committed to God, he must increase and I must decrease. The commitment that we're to make to God needs to be an everyday commitment that Jesus will become increasingly more important in my life and I will become less important in my own eyes. The issue in life is that, that we all face is that we're born with sinful natures. And to break that down, the most basic element is this, that we're all selfish, self-seeking individuals. We want what we want. And to be committed to God demands that we say to God, hey, you take preeminence in my life. You put to death my selfish nature. You control. Take me, Lord. To be committed to God means to say to God, you increase and I decrease in all my relationships. You increase and I decrease in my financial decisions. You increase, I decrease when I'm at work. You increase and I decrease in all the things that I want in life. John the Baptist got it. The question is, do we get it? The second commitment that needs to take place in our life, and that's to the Word of God. 
You know, you can find churches today that have very little confidence in the pages of this book. This book right here. They, or they will take this book and they'll slice it and dice it and carve it up so they can preach whatever they want and make people happy. But we need to remain unflinching in our trust in this book. So what does commitment to the Bible look like? And how should it affect our lives? I've divided it into two areas. One is our commitment to the authenticity of this book, or the accuracy, if you want to use another A word in its place. The authenticity of this book. The second area is I'm committed to the authority of the Bible in this book. Okay? So let's, let's look at the first one. You know, there's a lot of people like Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, all these atheists that spend a great deal of time and effort attempting to show and influence people to believe the Bible is a fairy tale and is a bunch of fictional stories. And I'm sorry they feel that way, but I'm convinced of the authenticity of this book. In, in other words, I believe that there really was a guy named Adam and there was really a woman named Eve. And I don't care if people look at me and say, man, you're insane to believe that, you know. I believe the Bible. And when I was in nursing school, I had a um, instructor. She, she was our anatomy and physiology instructor and she was a Christian who was a who was a evolutionist. And I always, I always, it always racked my mind. How can you be an evolutionist and, and say I'm a Christian? You know, because Christ, evolution says that things have to die to get better, right? Things die, progress, get better, die. The Christian says, no, everything started out good. They're simply not compatible. From the very first line in the Bible, in the beginning, God created to the very last sentence, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I believe it all, every word in between. It doesn't mean that I can explain it. There's, not, there's lots of things I can't explain. I mean, I believe in gravity, but I can tell you I can't explain it. I have no, I there's absolutely no way I can explain it. But do we have reason to believe in the book or is our faith completely blind? And I think we have plenty of reasons why we can trust in these words. Now, some people are going to say, well, you have your holy book. I have our, our we have our holy book. Why, why should we think of yours as better than ours? Like the more, uh, Muslims with the, the Quran, right? I'm going to give you three reasons why I have faith in the Bible. There's more, but I don't have time to give you a whole list. I'm just going to give you three. The first reason I believe in the Bible is the continuity that you find throughout the whole scripture. When you realize that the Bible is 66 books written by over 40 authors over 1,500 years, and you see how well the Bible fits together, all the books are linked in a way one way or another, as far as the narrative of Scripture goes, um, it starts out with create. Well, it starts out with God, creation, man, placed in a garden, perfect garden with the tree of life. Chapter three is the fall. Then God comes along and says He's going to intervene, and then we have the introduction of God in humanity through the covenant He made with Abraham. We see how God works through the history of Israel to bring about the Savior. And then you get to the Gospels where the, where the hero of the whole story comes. And we see how he is victorious in his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. Then you have the, New, the rest of the New Testament where the church is established. And you get the Revelation. And the very end of Revelation, we find man is placed in a garden with a tree of life. Where we started in a garden with a tree of life. We end up in a garden with a tree of life. There is no way a book can be put together like that without the influence of the Holy Spirit. The second reason, I believe, is archaeology. And I do have a, uh, you can put up the next slide there, Linda. Archaeology lends to proof of the scripture. 
I kind of the one the the what I have behind me on the screen is the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the most famous famous archaeological find that supports the Bible. They were found between 1947 and 56 in 11 caves that were near the Dead Sea. And they date back to over 300 years before Christ. All the books of the Hebrew Bible are there except for Nehemiah and Esther. In some cases, uh, there are several copies of the same book. Uh, for example, they found 30 copies of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, the most outstanding book in the Dead Sea Scrolls is the, the book of Isaiah, in which they found the whole book of Isaiah, and they also found an additional 20 copies. So you know, when you're reading the Bible and you're reading Isaiah, you can be absolutely confident the words you're reading are words that Isaiah wrote. That's, uh, that's another one. The second archaeological find, and you can put up the next one. Okay, it's hard to see. This was the um, wall that King Hezekiah built. That's it right behind me. It was found in 1970s, and it dates back to 716 to 687 BC, the time that Hezekiah ruled. And you can read about this wall in 2 Chronicles 32.5 that talks about the building of this wall. Hezekiah built this wall because the Assyrians had already conquered the northern kingdoms. And so he decided to build this wall, which in some places I think was over 20 feet wide. But he also diverted water. He made a tunnel to divert water from the Gihon Springs so the Assyrians couldn't shut off their access to water. Put the next slide here. There's the tunnel. So, you, can, you I mean, there's evidence for why we believe what we believe. Finally, they found a seal, and you can flip it one more time, Linda. They found a seal with the name on it that says, Belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. Uh, another example, archaeological example, is uh, they thought David was a mythical person, but in 1993 they found... Flip it again, Linda. They found what's called the Victory Stone that was dated to the 9th century BC, 900 years before Christ. And it has inscribed on it, I killed Ahaz, son of Joram, of the house of David. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> that's something else I'm going to show you in just a little while. All right. Yeah, that's it. And, and right there is... David's name. So, one more, just, just one more example. In 1907-1909, the German team excavated the site they believe was the city of Jericho. They found piles of mud bricks at the base of a mound that the city was built on. It wasn't until 1950 that a British archaeologist by the name of Kathleen Kenyon, using more modern methods, re-excavated the site and found out Piles of bricks were, she determined they were from the city walls that had collapsed when the city was destroyed. There we go. Well, she went on to say the only conclusion they could determine was there had been an earthquake, by, but the nature of the earthquake was unusual. It struck in such a way as to allow a portion of the city wall on the north side to remain standing while everywhere else it fell. Who do you think lived on the north side of Jericho? <clears throat> Rahab. Rahab lived right on the wall. And that, that, there's the wall that was left standing. And that was the only part of the wall that was left standing. There are more archaeological finds that I could share, but you get the picture that there is evidence for us to believe in the accuracy of the Bible. The third reason, of course, that I believe in the accuracy of scriptures is the prophecies. <clears throat> you know, sometimes Adventists will start evangelistic meetings with, they usually start out with the prophecies of Daniel. And in those prophecies, it shows the kingdoms that would rule in succession. Uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. 
And I understand why they do that. They do that so that people will start to have a trust in the Bible or, or to believe the Bible is true. But you know what? You can look it up in any encyclopedia. You can Google it, and you can find that the prophecies of Daniel are absolutely accurate. But the prophecies concerning the Savior throughout the whole Old Testament really give me faith to believe that the Bible is God's word. And here are just some of them, all right? Where he would be born, Micah 5.2. How he would die, Isaiah 53rd chapter. The manner of its death, Deuteronomy 21.22. The type of tomb he would be buried in with rich people, Isaiah 53.9. The amount that he would be betrayed for, 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11.23. The fact that his legs would not be broken, Psalms 34.20. The fact that he would be speared on his side, Zechariah 12.10. The fact that they would cast lots for his clothes, Psalms 22.18. All these prophecies fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. I really don't know how any rabbi, Jewish rabbi, who is really studying the Old Testament cannot come to the conclusion that Jesus really is the Savior. The, the second point, though, is just as important. I'm committed to the authority of Scripture in my life. And I think people have a harder time with that. You know, many churches, as I said earlier, are struggling with that issue. You look at the Methodist church right today, and it's split right in half. Half of the churches believe the Bible, and the, ultimately God has the authority to instruct us on how human sexuality should be followed. And the other half say, no, we're going to do it our way. God has the authority to instruct humans on how to live. And his instructions are not arbitrary. His knowledge and instructions are given to make man flourish. And he made us and he knows what's best for us. And preachers are preaching words that go contrary to God's word. Uh, hold up that. All right. This guy. I, I did debate whether I should even play this. All right. I debate it because he's so evil. He's so evil. But I want you to hear how he interprets John 3.16. Hopefully we can hear. Not working, Linda? It's going to drop open. For God so loved the world. Wouldn't that be awesome if that was the message they wanted everybody to hear and everybody to know? That God loves you so much. But sadly, I believe it's the latter part of the verse that they want to emphasize and make clear that Jesus, the only way that leads to the misunderstanding over John 3.16 has led many Christians in America today to believe that one must accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior or they will be condemned to hell. That is not what John 3.16 means. That is not what Jesus is saying in today's gospel. So what does it mean? What is he saying? Well, let's look at it together. If you notice in the gospel, Jesus is referring to terms, son of God, son of man, only begotten son. 
And he says things like, all who believe in him will have eternal life. Why wouldn't he say, all who believe in me will have eternal life? Why is Jesus talking in the third person? You know, people who refer to themselves in the third person are often narcissists. Jesus is not being narcissistic here. The reason Jesus is not being narcissistic here is because he's not referring to himself. He's not referring to himself. Son of God and only begotten Son are terms for the Christ. And I've told you before, the Christ existed billions of years before Jesus of Nazareth was even born. All right, you can stop that. When God heard everything. He goes on to say that we are all gods. He says we are gods. That we have divinity in us. That when when the text says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he was actually talking about us. That's what he says. That's what's being taught. I call that heresy. I call that heresy, and and it, and it's being taught by lots of people. It's not that's he's not just a one man show. I mean, there's another another guy. His name is Brandon Robertson, and he he preaches that uh, when Jesus said to the Phoenician woman, "It's not right to give meat of the children to dogs," that Jesus was being racist, and he had to repent. These pastors are going against the authority of Scripture. Uh, when I say I'm committed to the authority of Scripture in my life, it means I am committed to follow the instruction of the Holy Spirit where he convicts me and follow the Scriptures as the Spirit instructs me. If you, if you believe, does the Bible teach tithe? If you believe in tithe, when God, is, God convicted you of that, I would suggest you follow it. Because that's following the authority of Scripture. The third area of commitment that a Christian must make to prayer is, oh, I'm sorry, the third area of commitment a Christian must make is prayer. And what do I mean by that? Well, really, what I, what I really mean is, are you praying correctly? Now, that seems like a kind of a strange thing to say, right? Now, are you praying correctly? But, you know, you can pray a prayer that God does not hear. We have examples of it in the Bible. Cain and Abel, you know, it doesn't say they prayed. It said they brought an offering. But usually when you bring an offering, you pray, right? God, God heard Abel's prayer. He did not hear Cain's. We have the example of um, the tax collector and the Pharisee. Both of these guys went to the went to the church, they both prayed, but God only heard the prayer of the one, and only one of the men came out of that church justified. The Pharisee didn't. The disciples recognized the need of prayer, and they went to Jesus, and they said to him one day, Lord, teach us to pray. Did you notice what Jesus did not say? He did not say to them, guys, what's wrong with you? You're Jews. You should... <laughs> You've learned to pray from the little tots. You, you should know how to pray. No. Jesus, it made me think that even to Jesus, there are there is a certain posture we must assume when we come to the king of the universe. You know, when you meet the king or queen in England, there's all kinds of rules of etiquette, which this is off the subject, but I think that's ridiculous. But shouldn't we expect when we come to God that we should have a certain posture when we approach God. So God gives them the model prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer. And in it, I counted six different principles to be committed to. Okay, we're going to look go right through the Lord's Prayer real quick here. It starts out this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, I am committed to understanding the relationship that God desires to have with me and with you and Jesus tells us to begin our prayer with Father. Uh, have you ever stopped to think what a privilege it is for God desiring us to call him Father? I only had one Father in this life. 
And for me, it was not only a privilege and an honor, but it was a way of demonstrating my close relationship I had with a man named Milton Stan. None of you could call him father, you could call him brother, you can call him Milton, you can call him anything, but you couldn't call him father. I could. God wants us to call him father. Number two, the prayer continues with, how be thy name? Yes, God wants us to feel that close relationship and desires for us to view him as a father, but we do so with the understanding that we are talking about the God who rules the universe, the God who is sovereign. His holiness makes angels cover their face and their feet with their wings. The Jews around the third century BC, they began to think that that the, not Jehovah, Yahweh was so sacred they wouldn't even speak the word, so they came up with the term Adonai, which means our Lord. People today use the, the name of God in such a profane way. Just one example, have you ever heard the term OMG? I mean, I work in a rehab. You would think I work in a monastery. <laughs> I, I hear the I hear the Lord's name being used so much. Um, it is the third commandment. And, and we should be determined that we are going to take, not take the name of the Lord in vain. The third example, the prayer continues, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Being committed to God being committed to understanding that God's will is taking place in each of our lives, regardless whether the outcome appears good or bad. It's not always easy to understand, right? Go to the doctor and get a bad diagnosis, and while you're driving home, look up to God and ask, why? And the answer will be, if you remain committed to me, I will always be committed to you. Whatever the outcome, God's grace applied in our life is always the answer that will never let us down. And that's why God said to, to uh, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Number four, the prayer continues, give us this day our daily bread. We should be committed to understanding, accepting, and praising God for the blessings that we have. He's given, he has given and continues to give us not just food, but if you have a place to stay, you're blessed. If you have clothes, you're blessed. If you, if you have a mind that's able to understand the goodness of God, you're blessed. And then the fifth issue that we should contemplate when looking at the Lord's Prayer is forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that short sentence is the spiritual insight that will change a person's life. When you are committed to understanding, accepting, and experiencing the freedom that God offers to each of us through forgiveness, and then committed to committed to ourselves that we will extend to others the same forgiveness that God has given to us. Finally, the prayer ends, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, the times we're living in, we need to be committed to allowing God to deliver us from the effects of evil that surrounds us every day. Committed to understanding how God wants us, us to be his children and, and he our father. Committed to recognizing that God is sovereign and we should approach him with a humble heart. Committed in trusting him that his will we, will be done, and we can claim the promise that all things work together for good. Committed to loving God for the forgiveness he offers to us and extending that forgiveness to the people around us. Committed to praising God for the blessings he sends our way and committed to allowing God to come into our lives so he can deliver us from evil. I thought to myself, Jesus prayed all night. That must have been hard. But then this thought that came to me. If I was in a prison, they were going to execute me the next day because of my faith. Would it be hard to pray all night? <laughs> no, man. I don't think it would be hard at all. No. Nah. So that leads us to the fourth area that a Christian must display commitment to, and that's to each other. One of the greatest stories Jesus ever told was the story of the Good Samaritan, and I don't have time to read the story. But the, the story, you all know it, of the Good Samaritan is, is a story that demonstrates the commitment that we should have in dealing with other people, people who may or may not think like we do, who may not look like we do, who may not even appreciate us. Our church, just a few weeks ago, showed to the community how to be a Good Samaritan. 
Pastor Henry, who is the uh, pastor of the Shrewsbury Church, and the lady that helps him by the name of Carol came to the food pantry and began to tell us about a guy that they were trying to help with lodging. They had built this box, so to speak, and they had gone to all the churches around here. They had gone to the firehouse. They had gone everywhere they went. No one would allow them to put the box. So I said to him, I said, let me call our pastor. I called our pastor. Pastor called the elders and had a discussion. And our church, not one of us, our church, decided that we would allow this young man to stay on our property. And I believe it's had a profound effect on people outside the community. Fast forward a couple of weeks, and Chestertown had a showing of a film on the homelessness around here. Pastor Henry spoke. And this came from Carol when she came to visit us again at the food pantry. She said the place was packed and had standing room only. And Pastor Henry got up and said this about our church. While we may not agree with all their theological points, those people demonstrated that they talked the talk and walked the walk. That made me feel good. Yeah. I think when people look at our church, they're going to see it a little bit differently. They're going to see that we love people, we love Jesus, and we love people. And he's been a model tenant. And he may never become an Adventist, but I guarantee you he's going to remember how kind Adventist words are. Uh, just a little side note, Pastor Henry called me this week, and he said, you know, David, uh, I'm having a meeting with, I don't know, there's, there's an organization that uh, works with the homelessness. I don't know how big or how small it is, but he said, I would like you to come and talk to us about Adventism. So I said, uh, sure. <laughs> don't know yet what I'm going to say, but sure, I'll come and talk to you about Adventism. You know, so acts of kindness and reaching out has an effect. But we should not only show acts of kindness to people around us, we need to be kind to each other within the church. Our com commitment must not only be acts of love to the, outside the community of faith, but to each other. I can tell you to Bill, and Bill's going to get embarrassed, but I don't care. He comes to my place, and he works on my equipment because I can't. <laughs> I can tell you, if I try to work on something, it's going to cost extra to get it fixed. So Bill comes, and he works on my equipment. I always try to pay him, and he always refuses. And he said to me one time, and he, does, he won't remember this. I, I never will forget this. This was the most profound thing I've heard come out of Bill. He said, you know, if I let you pay me, then I simply work for you and you've given me money. But if I do it for you for nothing, then you get a blessing, and I get a blessing, and I don't want you to take my blessing away from me. Now, that's profound. My mouth, like, I was thinking to myself, man, if you had said that standing next to the Apostle Paul, he probably would have said, I like that. Can I put that in the book to Ephesians? <laughs> really? I mean, that's profound. We should be committed to showing our love to Christ through acts of good deeds to people outside the community of faith and inside the community of faith. Four areas of commitment. Commitment to God, commitment to the Bible, commitment to a prayer life, and commitment to others. May God bless each of you as you live out these four commitments in your life each day. Our closing 